and welcome aboard another edition of the Galat Says Podcast, available to you on iTunes, on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. My pasty ass is there. Please, while you subscribe to this bad boy, leave a rating, maybe even a review. Roasts are encouraged, but I will take this one from Erica D. 1990. I'd roast, but I have such a crush on Paul Galant, so I can't say anything mean about this podcast. Ha ha. Ha ha. Sup. Over the course of today's show, it's a quickie. I had to sit back. I had to rewatch that awful, awful Seahawks loss to the Minnesota Vikings as they are now 1-2 and two on Sunday. I want to talk about the Mariners, and I wish them the best of luck in the wars to come. But we're sticking straight to the Seahawks here. What a disaster. Let's get to it. If Paul gets to see it. You are definitely living in the hindsight world today, Paul. You got to f***ing grow, mother Are you kidding me? Paul Gillan, what the hell is wrong with you? Oh, boy. All of my worst fears about the Seahawks defense going into this year have come true thus far this season. I was skeptical about their ability to build off of the way that they closed out last year. After all, they closed out last year playing against a bunch of bums. Sure, Kyler Murray is a good quarterback, but... That was not the Kyler Murray that we've seen the first three weeks of this year that the Seahawks beat in that game that took place on Thursday night. Kyler Murray was banged up. He was dealing with a busted shoulder. Sure, they were effective against Jared Goff, but no one thinks that Jared Goff is a top 10, top 15 quarterback. The Rams especially. I mean, they were starting John Wofford against the Seahawks in the playoffs. I think Carson Wentz is respectable. But Carson Wentz with that Eagles team and no offensive line. Ooh, Dwayne Haskins, Colt McCoy. You were going up against quarterbacks down the stretch last season who don't belong in the NFL. And yeah, you took advantage of them, but you shouldn't have convinced yourself because of those victories that the Seahawks defense had that all of a sudden, these fuckers are going to be good this year. Okay, week one against Carson Wentz. A lot of pressure they put on him, which is impressive considering the Colts' offensive line. But over the last two weeks against Tennessee and then against Minnesota, they have just lost. And if you want to see the important statistics as how they lost and how they get pushed off the football, look no further than the team stats. Nine for 14, Minnesota was on third downs with long, long drives. 73 plays to Seattle's 52 plays and a time of possession of 35-53 over 10 minutes more than what Seattle had. And it's not even like they were scoring touchdowns every single drive. They had the football four times in the second half, but three of those four possessions ended up being eight minutes and 26 seconds, a 16-play, 50-yard field goal drive, 11 plays, 70 yards, five minutes and one seconds field goal drive, 12 plays, 88 yards, 708 another field goal drive. And the Seahawks offense could never get things going. Five plays, five plays, five plays. The defense cost them this one. And the defense has exposed itself as fraudulent, much like the offenses that they were able to take down down the stretch last year. And here's the worst part about that. Pete Carroll still has faith in a defense that has never been better than mediocre over the last half decade. Why? I really don't understand this. Now, early on in this game, the Seahawks offense was moving the football. First drive of the game, touchdown. Second drive of the game, field goal. Third drive of the game, touchdown. And they're driving down the field. It's fourth and three at Minnesota's 26. And yeah, you have Jason Myers, who the broadcast kept reminding us has hit a ton of field goals in a row. He misses a 44-yard field goal. When it's fourth and three and you have as much faith as you do in your kicker, but not that kind of faith in your quarterback, in your offense, you are putting your defense in a spot where they're going to have to do more than they possibly can. Pete Carroll keeps doing this. In the fourth quarter, the Seahawks decided to punt They're down 10 points. It's 27-17. It's fourth and seven at the Seattle 43. They're down two two scores. There's 10 minutes left. There's plenty of time left in the game. But Pete Carroll said that he punted because he trusted the defense to get him the ball back. Why? 
Was it because of on third down where Russell Wilson was under pressure and Travis Homer, the supposedly best uh, blitz picking up running back in the NFL and Damian Lewis weren't able to get a guy who ran straight up the middle, forced a difficult throw by Russ, but Freddie Swain was wide open. He should have hit him. Was it because of that? Or was it because of Pete Carroll saying that the percentages of a fourth and seven are just really difficult? It's an uphill battle. Normally, I would be with Pete Carroll there. I would say to myself, you know what? It just ain't working today on offense. It has not been working in the second half. Let's be careful here. But you saw what the Vikings were doing. For the second straight week, the Vikings completely owned the line of scrimmage. They did this last week against the Arizona Cardinals. I mean, honestly, the Cardinals are lucky to have won that game. Minnesota played really well. Kirk Cousins played really well. Dalvin Cook played really well. But it wasn't Dalvin Cook who was kicking your ass in this game. It was Alexander Madison who, for whatever reason, is really good against the Seahawks. 26 carries for 112 yards. Kirk Cousins, yes, he was really good. Justin Jefferson and uh, Tyler Conklin. Adam Thielen, K.J. Osborne. I mean, he's got weapons there. But it was Alexander Madison and it was screen passes to Madison that just killed Seattle. And it has me wondering, okay, what does this defense have to, lo- to lean on? Physicality? Clearly not. Not on, the def- not on the defensive line and not at linebacker. They don't have enough depth at linebacker. Okay, you got Bobby Wagner. But after that, has Jordan Brooks, who left the game with cramps, has he been picking up the slack where K.J. Wright left off last year? He hasn't. And that's concerning, too. This is a first-round pick that you have on your defense. Much like L.J. Collier, you need to get an impact from some of these guys. Maybe it's unfair at this point to expect them to deliver on first-round potential a couple of years into their, into their careers, but you need more from them. And when this Seahawks defensive line is just getting pushed off the ball and pushed off the ball and you see Kerry Hyder get injured in the game, you now have to wonder about this team's ability over the course of a 17-game season now to do anything, to hold up against some really good running attacks in your division. San Francisco can make it work. The Cardinals and Chase Edmonds. Edmonds has looked pretty good thus far. Kyler Murray, you know how difficult he is to stop. And the Rams, okay, they're dealing with some issues of their own, but with Matt Stafford throwing the way that he is, that running game for LA is probably going to do pretty well against you too. So there's no physicality. There's no pressure. What are you hanging your hat on then? Are you hanging your hat on the scheme? Hell to the fucking no. Holy shit. That's my biggest question coming out of this one. What the fuck's going on out there? Late third quarter, early fourth quarter. Everyone is pissed off. And you keep on seeing all these close-up shots. It's Jamal Adams. It's Quandre Diggs. It's DJ Reed. All of these guys are looking incredulously at each other, wondering what the fuck is happening. I have no answers. They had no answers. But my theory is this. Either the Seahawks scheme is bad, or the players... Don't like the scheme. Either way, that's fucking bad. And I'm sorry for cussing as much as I have, and I'll try to tone it down the rest of the way. When you look at that defense, you know where it has real issues. A cover three defense, you're going to give up a lot of plays underneath, and there's going to be certain plays in the scene that guys like Kirk Cousins are going to be able to take advantage of all game. Kirk Cousins is not a guy who likes to throw the football deep, but he is very content in dinking and dunking and dinking and dunking and dinking and dunking in those Two spots that I talked about on uh, last week's podcast in the middle of the zone that are always going to be wide open against the cover three. And all that underneath stuff, it killed them. DJ Reed said after the game that the Vikings schemed our ass up. And he ain't lying. They really did. Seattle never had an answer. They just sat back and you could see as the game was going on that they had no ability to adjust out of their issues. That's got to be partly on personnel, but that's also on the scheme. Pete Carroll afterwards was asked why everyone was so frustrated, and he says that he thinks guys were frustrated staying on top of routes and giving up the underneath stuff. Again, Kirk Cousins doesn't take shots downfield. Why are you going to allow him to do exactly what he wants over the course of a game? You did it all game long. You just kept on giving it to him and giving it to him and giving it to him. At a certain point, something's got to change. You can't just throw the same thing out there. But maybe that's all that the Seahawks can do. You know, having talked to Pete Carroll and asked him about the defense and the scheme that they run, 
he has talked about the intricate simplicity that this defense has. That it being so simple allows for some of these guys to make plays all over the field. But who are those guys that are making plays for you? It's not your cornerbacks because they're so far off the ball. It's not your linebackers. It's not Bobby Wagner, who is a compiler of stats. He gets tackles. Are any of those tackles impactful? Is he disrupting the passing game in any way, shape, or form? Jamal Adams, same page. I like Jamal Adams. I think he's great at flying all over the football field. But your two best players, not named Russell Wilson, at least based off of what you're paying them, are essentially glorified tackle hoarders. What does that do for you? What does that do for you? These guys are at the second level of your defense and you're getting lit up by screens. And every single five-yard gain by Alexander Madison, they're making tackles downfield, but if they're making them downfield, who fucking cares what they do? Who cares about the tackle number at the end of the game? And you guys do this all the time. You Bobby Wagner truthers out there, you continuously come after me and say, oh, well, look at the numbers. Oh, he's an all-pro. He is not an all-pro. Not anymore. He is not having the kind of impact. And there was a play on the left sideline where there's a screen downfield. He's getting absolutely eviscerated by a Vikings offensive lineman. And he looked like he wanted no part of it. Again, I understand why he's a linebacker. He's going up against an offensive lineman. But if you're a linebacker in this league, it can't just be all about coverage anymore. You got to be able to take on blocks. You got to be able to disrupt things by just sacrificing your body out there. And your two best defensive players have no ability to do that. Bobby Wagner and Jamal Adams, what are they giving to you right now? Now, I suppose that you could take a look at the Seahawks' defense and maybe you could scheme something up differently, but I don't think that Pete Carroll's going to change anything with this defense. And I don't think that Ken Norton Jr. is doing really anything on defense. I think he is just an extension of Pete Carroll there. Every single week, I think you're going to see more of this. And now, the next two weeks, you're going up against the 49ers and the Rams, and you're 1-2. and two. The Rams are 3-0. and oh. The 49ers are 2-1. and one. Both of those teams, even with the issues that maybe the Rams have had defensively compared to where they were last year, though they look pretty good against the Bucs, or the 49ers have had at quarterback, on offense, those two teams have a game up on you. And those two teams, I feel like, with Kyle Shanahan, with Sean McVay, are going to be able to out-scheme you. So what the hell are you going to do this week? How do you go back to the drawing board and change things up? I don't have the answers. I don't think the Seahawks have the answer. I think you're going to see the same thing that you've been seeing week in, week out from this defense thus far this year. And I'm not even getting into the offense today. You know, the offense, it has to do more. The offensive line has to be better. I get it. Brandon Shell's out in this game. He's inactive. But where's Damian Lewis at? Damian Lewis has taken a massive step back, I think, moving to left guard. Kendall Fuller at center, I'm not thrilled about that. Great, Gabe Jackson. Great, Dwayne Brown. But the middle of your, your, middle, the middle of your offensive line, it is not protecting Russell Wilson. Fine, he only got sacked twice in this game. Great, neat, splendid, wonderful. But you're getting destroyed in the trenches week in, week out. And that's why in the second half of games, the Seahawks offense is dead last in the NFL in points per drive. I'm pissed off. That was a disgrace on Sunday. A disgrace where the Seahawks have no answers. What are you going to do defensively now? You're going to sign Richard Sherman, who's supposedly about to sign with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Even if you wanted to sign Richard Sherman, he's not going to fix anything. Cornerback is not the issue right now. I know some people are going to say, oh, well, Trey Flowers is playing too far off the football. I think that this is what the defense is being told to do. They're telling DJ Reed to sit back. They're telling Trey Flowers to sit back. And if those two guys are sitting back, Dink and dunk and dink and dunk and dink. Anyone can do this. You can see Jared Goff tearing the Seahawks up with the way that this defense is currently playing right now. They are allowing so much to happen in front of them. And at a certain point, if there's nobody in that area of the field where you're paying a lot of money, Bobby Wagner, Jamal Adams, if those two guys aren't doing anything for you, I just don't see how you make any stops or at least the necessary amount of stops to win a game. Back-to-back second halves, your defense can't get off the field. They look tired, they look gassed, and they just don't have the depth, I think, necessary to, over the course of a long game, win a game where they're going to be on the field more than the offense is. You don't have enough linebackers. Cody Barton, not that good. Jordan Brooks, if he's cramping in these games, that makes me concerned about his long-term durability over the course of a game. All right, 73 plays, I can get why he was cramping out there, but God, you don't have anyone behind him. The Seahawks are one and two, and I will pause with the freaking out for a moment to say this. You're seeing probably a lot of statistics about how 
teams that have two losses over the course of a year don't make the playoffs very often. Throw a lot of those statistics out the window. First off, this is the second year where 14 teams make the playoffs, not 12. Second, this is the first 17-game schedule that we've ever seen. So a lot of those numbers, I think you could sit back and not freak out about. But the Cardinals are 3-0, the Rams are 3-0, and the 49ers are 2-1. And And right now, you're one of the teams that everyone is asking, what the fuck is wrong with them? And I think the answer is, the coaching... It has been subpar to this point. P. Carroll, the defense, Ken Norton Jr., they don't know what they're doing in the second half of games. Shane Waldron, I've loved what I've seen in the first half, but as the game wears on, what's been going on in the second? Against Indy, against Minnesota, in between that, against Tennessee, nothing. Figure it out, guys. There's a lot of season left to be played, but what you're doing, scheme-wise on defense, it ain't working. Get back to the drawing board. A-S-A-P. That's going to do it for today's quickie edition of the Galant Says Podcast. I appreciate everyone who has subscribed to the podcast. YouTube, youtube.com slash Paul Galant. If you want to see the pastiness in action, we got a nice little light here so you can see how much more... um, how much less pigment I actually have. Um, You can subscribe to this podcast, of course, on iTunes, on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a five-star rating, a nice review, or a roast. We'll read them either way. So long. Farewell. We'll be back at it on Friday.